All right. If we could have everyone take their seats, because I know that um, Dr. Adams has a very busy day today. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, on behalf of the Arizona Department of Health Services, we're so excited that you could join us um, for this early grand rounds. Um, I'm Dr. Kara Christ. I'm the director of the Department of Health Services and the state health official for Arizona. Um, and we are just very excited that we have such a true public health advocate in Dr. Adams. So he was the state health official for Indiana before um, becoming the Surgeon General. Um, so I've known him for a while. If there was a true physician who advocated on behalf of public health, it is Dr. Adams. But I am gonna turn it over to Dr. Reed to do the official introduction. But we just wanna thank everyone for being here with us this morning. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chris. Uh, Dr. Chris exemplifies what we aspire for our students, uh, someone who's a skilled physician, an ardent advocate for public health, and an excellent leader, someone who has served Arizona with distinction for many years. So thank you, Dr. Chris. And, and we are extremely proud to claim Dr. Chris as a graduate of the University of Arizona College of Medicine and also as a graduate of our residency program at Banner University Medical Center, formerly Good Samaritan, so congratulations. Uh, and, and through Dr. Chris, we are fortunate to have an outstanding speaker here today, the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Jerome Adams. Dr. Adams says that believes in partnerships and better health through better partnerships that exemplifies what we attempt to do here every day through our partnerships with nine clinical partners, different sister in universities and institutions, many different people throughout the Valley working to promote education and improve the community health through collaboration and partnership. Uh, Dr. Adams is a Meyerhoff Scholar, he, which is one of the most extraordinary programs in the country. He is a graduate of the University of Maryland where you see degrees not only in biochemistry, but in psychology. And I can imagine that psychology has been very useful to you recently <laughs> in, your, in your current roles. Um, after that, he went on to the University of Indiana where he received his med medical degree and then did a residency not only in anesthesiology, but also in internal medicine and received a degree in public health from Berkeley. So really an extraordinary career there. Um, as mentioned, uh, he was uh, appointed by former Governor <coughs> Pence to become the State Health Commissioner for Indiana before he became the Surgeon General of the United States. He also has a different title. He's the Vice Admiral of the U.S. Public Health Commission Corps. He supervises 6,500 uniformed public health uh, service officials in 800 locations throughout the U.S. and throughout the world promoting and ensuring the health of our nation. So please join me in giving a very warm <coughs> Phoenix, Arizona, and College of Medicine welcome to Dr. Adams, the Surgeon General. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to come out and see me this morning. I really love when I get a chance to go onto medical campuses to uh, get to, to rub elbows with, with uh, some of my peeps. I actually still, I actually still practice. Uh, about one day a month, I still uh, practice anesthesia at Walter Reed in DC. I feel it's very important for me personally to be able to continue to say that as a nation's doctor, I am a practicing doctor. I also uh, uh, really feel that it informs a lot of what I do because there's a lot of policy that's made in this country with the best of intentions. I really do believe that. I believe that whether you're Democrat, Republican, or independent, uh, no matter what part of the country you're from, uh, I believe that 99.9% uh, .9 of our politicians are waking up every morning trying to, trying to figure out how they can make our country uh, a better place. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, the, 
pathway to hell is paved with good intentions in many cases, <laughs> as the saying goes. And uh, that's why it's important that, to me that, that we don't make decisions about how health care is practiced without the input of practicing physicians and providers. And I get a lot of that input by being in the operating room and being in the hospital. I also uh, am not supposed to tell you all to lobby, uh, but I uh, will tell you that there's a saying, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And in many cases, you all, us, are on the menu because we don't show up at, at, to, to, to the discussions. And other people are there, and, and it's a zero-sum game in many cases. And so folks are divvying up the pie, and we're not there because we don't value advocacy to the degree that we value clinical work, that we value some of the other things that uh, actually will help us uh, achieve our goals in a much greater way. And I'm already going off tangent, so I apologize. How much time do I have? <laughs> uh, okay, all right, because I, I do want to save some time. I do want to save some time at the end for questions. But uh, there's actually a book that was written um, about the Surgeon's General, the past Surgeon's General. There's only, there have only been 20 Surgeon's General in the last 200 years. The uh, first Surgeon General was named by John Adams, the second President of the United States. And uh, since that time, there have been twice as many Presidents of the United States, more than twice as many as there have been Surgeon's General. So I feel really honored and blessed to, uh, to serve in this role. This book goes through the history, and uh, it comes to the conclusion at the end that we don't need a Surgeon General anymore. It comes to the conclusion at the end, and many people have said this, that uh, why should we pay a $160,000 salary for a Surgeon General? We could do so much more with that money because, hey, we're not, we're not doing anything uh, inefficient with the billions or trillions of dollars that we're spending on other things out there. But uh, I, I'm not telling you this story because I take <coughs> offense to that, even though I do. Um, <laughs> I, I want to tell you all a story about me. I worked at a level one trauma center for the past decade. I can tell you with no, no arrogance whatsoever that I have saved lives. I've been on call and gotten and gone home the next morning and knew that if I wasn't there in that hospital that night, the person might not be alive today. So over the last decade of working in a level one trauma center, uh, let's say I saved 50 lives a year because I wasn't saving lives every single day. Some days I was doing elective uh, <coughs> ortho cases with Dr. Meldrum and uh, you know, and that's important too, but we, we were improving uh, lives for people, but we weren't saving lives each and every day. So let's say I saved 50 lives a year. Times 10 years, I've saved 500 lives uh, employed as an anesthesiologist. And I'm not going to get into how much I got paid, but I did get paid a lot more than what I did to be Surgeon General, <laughs> to be an anesthesiologist. So in April of last year, I put out an advisory, first Surgeon General's advisory in over a decade, helping folks understand that uh, they need to know about and be willing to carry naloxone because we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic. Within a month after that advisory was out, prescribing and dispensing of naloxone had gone up 300% across the country. Just by using the power of my voice, I literally saved thousands of lives in a month. So you tell me, is that worth $160,000 from the American taxpayers? I want to thank the University of Arizona for having me here today. Uh, I really appreciate being here with each and every one of you, and I want to thank you for, for what you do each and every day, because I don't want you to take from my story that what I did over the last 10 years was not significant. We need people there fishing folks out of the stream when they fall in, because there will always be people who fall into the stream. Uh, something's going to happen to me one day, and I want someone there to fish me out of the stream. But uh, as the story goes, we also need people moving upstream <coughs> to figure out why people are falling in in the first place and to uh, turn off the spigot. Now, I gave you a little bit of history about the Surgeon General, but what's interesting is when I talk to audiences, many times people have no clue what a Surgeon General is 
or does. So I'm gonna dispel a couple of myths here. First of all, I am not the Attorney General. <laughs> Believe it or not, I have been introduced as the Attorney General many times, including by medical people. <laughs> Attorney, surgeon, there's a difference there. Uh, second, to the untrained eye, I may appear to be an airline pilot. I am not. <laughs> and uh, I've got many funny stories about being mistaken by a foreign airline pilot. I've had people ask me for headphones on planes before. <laughs> and the truth is, like a true servant leader, I got the headphones. <laughs> true story. Um, but uh, I'm also neither a surgeon nor a general. And there are people who have the misbelief that the Surgeon General has to be a surgeon and that the Surgeon General is a general. I'm an anesthesiologist and proud to be, and I'm a Vice Admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, which is why I wear this uniform. There are seven branches of the uniform service. Does anyone know them? Shout them out. Marine Corps, Army, Army, Army Air Navy, 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 Air Force, Coast, Coast, Coast Guards. Guards. Someone said NOAA. Who said NOAA? All right, and then the other one is the United the States Public, Public Health Service. Service. All right, all right. <laughs> so there are seven branches of uniformed services, and one of the things that people don't realize about the Surgeon General is just like there's a head of the Army, head of the Navy, head of the Air Force, I'm the operational head of one of the uniformed services. And so uh, that was something that I knew before I came in, but uh, I didn't realize how much time it took. You're running a 6,500 person corporation, essentially, with people all over the world whose mission is to protect, promote, and advance America's health. We respond to Ebola. We responded to the wildfires in California. I actually was in Puerto Rico in the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, right after the hurricanes last year. And so I just mention that because there are many different ways that you can serve with your health degrees. And I would say to you, consider at least consider the idea of serving in uniform because it is a tremendous honor and uh, we really are doing great things out there to protect the country. But the most visible role of the Surgeon General, the one that people know, know about, is as the nation's doctor. And as the nation's doctor, I'm focused on promoting health, preventing disease, and most importantly, leading with the science. Uh, I also have that moniker of nation's doctor, but I tell folks, uh, I honestly think I got this role and I think I have more credibility, not as the nation's doctor, but as the nation's patient. I grew up uh, as a poor minority in a rural area. Uh, there's hardly a disease that you could name that I haven't had personal experience with uh, through my family. My grandfather died from lung cancer, smoked. My other grandfather had a stroke from, hyper, uh, from hypertension. My, uh, I have several family members who suffer from substance use disorder and addiction. My wife actually has metastatic melanoma and is receiving immunotherapy treatments right now. And so uh, I, I share those stories, number one, because a lot of us hide those stories. We don't like to talk about the problems that we have. We like to say we're strong, and we're, we, we, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't bother us. But uh, I, I like to think I represent people across the country who are suffering not only from disease, but from stigma, from lack of access, from a lot of the barriers that lead to these diseases in the first place, but that also prevent people from getting the treatment and the care that they need when they do have issues. And again, grew up in a rural area, like much of rural Arizona. I had asthma myself when I was younger. I went back and forth to the children's hospital, which was two hours away, because that's where I needed to go to get treatment. Uh, only helicopter ride I've ever had in my life was in Status Asthmaticus being flown from the local county <laughs> critical access hospital that couldn't break my Status Asthmaticus to the Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. So again, I'm known as the nation's doctor, but uh, I also think that my most important role is representing the nation's patients. During my tenure, there's three main areas that I'm focusing on. Number one is addressing substance misuse. That includes <coughs> tobacco, that includes e-cigarettes, that includes uh, marijuana. Uh, most importantly right now, that includes the opioid epidemic, which I talked a lot about with, with Governor Ducey just yesterday. Number two is improving the health of our communities by making the connection between the investments in economic health 
uh, between health and economic prosperity. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But number one issue people vote on, Democrat or Republican, black or white, rural or urban, it's jobs in the economy. It's not health. Uh, and I'm going to say something provocative here, too. You all don't even prioritize your own health on a regular basis. And I know it because you all are medical professionals. How many times have you not eaten right, not eaten at all, eaten fast food? How many times have you not gotten enough sleep? How many times have you not worked out for the sake of your job? We prioritize our job over our own health each and every day. We're the worst offenders as physicians. And so it's important for us to realize that because then we go out and wonder why our patients won't do what we say. <laughs> why won't they prioritize their health? Why won't politicians do what we say and prioritize their health? Well, because that's not how we're geared to think. And since we're in a medical crowd, and I usually don't get this wonky, but you brought up my, sci my psychology background. If you, anyone heard about Maslow's hierarchy? So Maslow's hierarchy looks at how humans prioritize what they do in their lives. Maslow's hierarchy says we first prioritize the things we need to live, food and water. And, and, and how do we get those as adults? We get them by getting a job so that we can provide for ourselves. The second thing that we prioritize in Maslow's hierarchy is safety and security. So once I can make sure I can literally live from one second to the next, then I want to make sure me and my family are in a safe environment. And it's no coincidence that the number two issue people vote on, and this is not my opinion, if you look up Gallup polls, number two issue people vote on is uh, safety and security. Some version of safety and security uh, in their point of view, and you hear every politician talk about this. They're running on jobs and they're running, running on keeping your community, keeping you, keeping your country safe, however they, they, uh, they make that out. Next is, uh, is relationships. So it's how, can I find someone who I can spend my life with? Can I find friends? Can I find family? Can I find support? The lowest priority on Maslow's hierarchy is this thing called self-actualization. What is self-actualization? Self-actualization is being the best me that I can be. And it's important, but it's a lower priority than all those other things. Self-priority, or self-actualization is the New Year's resolution. Once I get that great job, once I ace that test, once I uh, uh, buy the house, once I make sure we're safe, once I find a uh, relationship and love and affection, then I'll get around to hitting the gym. Then I'll get around to quitting smoking. Then I'll get around to being the best me that I can be. And that's the problem that we have. We're talking to people and expecting them to flip Maslow's hierarchy on its head. We're expecting them to prioritize something that we've known for years they don't prioritize and that we don't prioritize ourselves. So my goal is to get folks to understand that you can't achieve those other things that are important to you that are higher on your priority list unless you invest in your own health and in community health. So I'll talk about the, the Community Health and Economic Prosperity Report in just a bit. But the third issue I'm working on is raising awareness of the link between our nation's health and its safety and security because I told you that's the number two issue people vote on. We know that healthy communities have less crime. So the next time a politician says to you, we can't afford to invest in your health initiative because we want to put more police cars on the streets, we need to be able to show them the data that says if you invest in this health initiative, you won't need so many police cars on the streets. That's how we motivate people to change. And another shocking statistic for you all, Seven out of 10 of our 18 to 25 year olds are ineligible for military service in this country. Seven out of 10. Why? Because they can't meet the educational requirements, they uh, can't pass the physical, or they have a criminal background record. And I would assert to you that all three of those things are affected by our nation's poor health. Can't, as, as Jocelyn Elders, Surgeon General Jocelyn Elders said, that you can't educate a child if a child isn't healthy. We know that uh, our prison system actually is our de facto mental health care system. Mm -hmm. We know that people can't pass the physical because our kids are in front of screens and because we're force feeding them processed foods and because we don't have complete streets. And so again, our nation's security is less than what it should be because our nation's health is less than what it should be. 
Now, as Dean Reed said, my guiding principle across all of my priorities is better health through better partnership. Because the truth is we can only change our collective futures together. You all in this room can't change our collective futures unless we work with other people, unless we work together. And I'm gonna go off on another tangent here, uh, but I would uh, encourage you if you uh, wanna hear my perspective on physician burnout to check out my uh, AMA talk that I gave last year at the AMA, American Medical Association annual meeting on physician burnout. And I know physician burnout is a big deal for all of you all. And we can debate back and forth about whether it's because of electronic health records or whether it's because of complications in billing or whether it's because of any number of other issues that in my opinion are, uh, are working around the margins. They're all important, they all have an additive effect, but one of those things alone isn't gonna solve physician burnout. Here is my take on physician burnout. It's not because we're working too hard. Any of you all scared of hard work? We wouldn't have been here if we, weren't, if we were scared of hard work. Again, I worked at a level one trauma center. I've worked 36 hours in a row before. And uh, that didn't burn me out. You know why it didn't burn me out? Because I was fulfilled at the end of it. I felt like I made a difference. I felt like those last 36 hours were well spent and it was a good investment of my time and of my training. I think physicians are getting burned out because they're doing the same thing over and over and over again and not getting a different result. So, true story, I had a um, young man who came into my operating room and he'd been shot multiple times, saved his life. Felt good, felt awesome. I still remember this young man because I remember going into the operating room and this young man who, you know, thought he was so hard and tough just grabs my hand right before he falls asleep and says, Doc, am I gonna die? And I said, not if I can help it. And I still remember this young man. So that's not the, 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 the punchline to the story. The punchline to the story is that that young man was in my operating room two more times during the last 10 years because he got stabbed and because he got shot again. That's what causes physician burnout because the first time I took care of that young man, I felt invigorated. I felt like I changed the world. The second time I saw that young man, I thought, huh, this is interesting. The third time I saw that young man, I was thinking, is this really a good use of my time? Who else could I be helping and changing their life relative to seeing this young man over and over and over again. And that, to me, that's physician burnout. We need to change the narrative so that physicians and healthcare providers can really feel like they are making a difference. And to do that, we need partnerships and we need collaboration. Oftentimes, the solutions are complex. Oftentimes, they're controversial. And we know, especially that when they're controversial, we can't work in silos, and the opioid epidemic is a prime example of this, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time focusing on the opioid epidemic, not because it's the only issue, not even because it's the most impactful issue from a numbers point of view, but because it exemplifies a lot of the, the issues that we're concerned about and some of the problems with our approach but some of the opportunities moving forward. Uh, as Surgeon General, I'm committed to strengthening connections within the health community, but I'm also committed to forging new connections with other people, businesses, academia, the military, faith leaders, and others. And colleges and hospitals not only have to have a seat at the table, they gotta step up to the plate and, and own their part of the issue. I have been involved in the leadership of the American Medical Association. I've been involved in the leadership of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And I will tell you, I've sat at the table when folks have said, this is your fault, or that's your fault. Uh, any of the surgeons that are people who work in the perioperative setting know that anesthesia gets blamed for everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I've spent a lot of my career saying, that's not my fault. <laughs> you know what? That doesn't change anyone's mind. What changes people's minds is when we step up to the plate and show them how we can be part of the solution, and when we show them that we can be part of a team. Well, in America, an estimated 2.1 million people 
are struggling with opioid use disorder because our teams haven't formed or they've failed. People with opioid use disorder are our friends, our neighbors, our family, and here's another shocking, provocative statement. Statistically speaking, someone in here today, maybe a few of us in here today, suffer from opioid use disorder or have suffered from opioid use disorder. Like many Americans, the opioid crisis isn't just pressing, but for me it's personal. My baby brother Philip, and some of you may have heard me share this story, is currently serving a 10-year prison sentence for crimes that he committed to support his addiction. He stole $200 from a vacant property and was given a 10-year prison sentence. Now, I don't share that story to evoke your empathy. I share that story because we're pragmatic people. We all did really well in math and science, right? 150 to $200 a day to incarcerate someone times a 10-year prison sentence. Even if he only serves half of that sentence, all of you all as taxpayers are gonna pay between a quarter of a million and a half a million dollars to incarcerate him. And then he's gonna get out because he's not getting treatment and probably be right back in all over again. And for the rest of his life, until he dies of an overdose, you're gonna keep paying for him over and over and over again. So versus spending $500,000 to incarcerate him, what if we spent $5,000 to get him into a good treatment program? What if we spent $500 to provide him access to mental health services to treat his anxiety and depression so that he didn't self-medicate in the first place? What if we spent $50 on a after-school program to build resilience in communities so that Again, he wouldn't have gone down this pathway 15, 20 years ago. Wouldn't that have been a smarter investment? I mean, you all are the scientists, you all are the doctors. Which one makes the most sense to you? $500,000 over and over and over again? Or $50 or $500 or even $5,000? I also share my story because I hope it gives <coughs> others the courage to share theirs so that we can fight stigma. Uh, I get asked all the time as Surgeon General, here's one of the toughest things I, uh, questions I, I get is, what's the biggest problem? Everyone wants the Surgeon General to take on their cause. Everyone does. It really is one of the most difficult parts about this job because every day I've got people coming at me saying, you need to say diabetes is the most important. You need to say cancer is the most important. You need to say opioids are the most important. You need to say e-cigarettes are the most important thing out there. But if you ask me what the biggest killer is, what the biggest problem is, I think it's stigma. And that's across the board, because stigma prevents people from coming forward, from confronting issues, from seeking help. Now, that's my personal story. I've also been on the professional side of the opioid epidemic. As State Health Commissioner of Indiana, I oversaw the response to the largest ever outbreak of HIV related to injection drug use. Anyone hear about that? I'm, I, I, I'm well, not famous for it, I'm infamous for it. It's Time Magazine, NPR, uh, and the, uh, the health community was ripping me and my state to shreds because this was at the beginning of the opioid epidemic and everyone thought it was a moral failure on one side, thought people were getting what they deserved on one side, and the scientific community on the other side was saying, gosh, if you all would only just flip Maslow's hierarchy on its head and force people to ingest the science, this would have never happened. Well, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what happened there. In order to curb an opioid-fueled crisis that was impacting the rural community of Austin, Indiana, 4,000 people, we had to form strategic partnerships with local stakeholders that extended beyond the people in this room, extended beyond the traditional health folks. And so, I've been all over the world, literally, talking about this HIV outbreak. I get invited because people want to know, how did you solve? This was a historic HIV outbreak. A town of 4,000 people, rural, all white, and uh, about 4,000 people. CDC Director Tom Frieden at the time said it had a higher incidence rate of HIV than anywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is rural middle America with a higher incidence rate in the community than any equivalent in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm a doctor, I'm a public health person. 
get invited by these medical groups and they say, how did you solve this outbreak? Who did you work with? Was it the CDC? Was it the School of Medicine? Which of your partners was most crucial to you solving this outbreak? And they were all very important. Make no mistake about it. My health partners were very important. But they weren't who I most needed to get things started in terms of solving this outbreak. The person I called first was the local sheriff. The second person I called was the local pastor. The third group of people I met with was the local chamber of commerce. And while this may seem surprising to some of you all, I knew, I knew we would never be successful without enlisting the trust and cooperation of those community members. I'm a doctor, I have a public health degree. I knew what we needed to do from the science point of view. I also knew that community wasn't ready to prioritize the science over their public safety, over their perception of how it was going to impact jobs in the economy in their community, over the many other things that we prioritize in our lives over the science. And public health professionals like myself, like many of you all, we like to sit in our, in our offices at our academic institutions. And uh, I'm not being pejorative to any of you all because I'm a, I, I'm a professor right now myself at uh, Uniformed Services University and I've been a professor at Indiana University for the last 10 years. But we like to sit in our offices and write these journal articles and tell people how they need to solve their problems in their communities without actually stepping into those communities, without actually listening to what their concerns are. And I didn't want to make that mistake in Scott County, Indiana. So here's what I learned. I learned that the sheriff was worried about his officers getting stuck by syringes. He actually had officers saying, I'm not going to come to work anymore because I don't want to get HIV trying to arrest someone who, uh, who's got needles in their pocket. So I heard that, and I shared with him how syringe service programs actually lower needle stick injuries to law enforcement officers by 60%. I talked to the faith leaders and said, what's your concern? And they said they were worried about enabling drug use. And I shared with them that if we worked together to organize a syringe service program, we would ensure that everyone who came in got referred to addiction and recovery support services. And that the syringe service program wouldn't be a pathway to greater addiction, it would be a pathway to recovery. So together, we were all able to determine an evidence-based approach to address everyone's concerns and provide the community with a solution to overcome the HIV outbreak. Now, I told you that I always try to lead with the science. I want to make sure every conversation has evidence base behind it. But we also have to understand that public policy, the key word in there is public. We have to have the buy-in of the public. We've got to work with them. And that's what we had to do in Scott County, Indiana. Now I want to talk a little bit about the medical side of what was going on in Scott County uh, because I mentioned good intentions. And in Scott County, this crisis started with good intentions. People were misusing a powerful prescription opioid called Opana. Well, back when I was in medical school, we were taught that opioids like Opana were not addictive, that they were a great way to treat people's pain and that as long as you were giving them the people to treat pain, they would never become addicted to these substances. And not only that, I was told we were bad doctors <laughs> if we didn't give them these medications because by golly, pain is the fifth vital sign. And if you aren't assessing and appropriately treating that fifth vital sign with the only thing that they give you, opioids, because the saying, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, was true here, then you're a bad doctor. Well. Over the years, our knowledge of pain management has evolved. Thankfully, prescribers have begun to correct their dispensing patterns. And I'm happy to say in the last five years, physicians have decreased opioid prescriptions by 22% nationwide. You all have done a great job here in Arizona. But there's a but. And the but is that even though we've made strides with decreasing opioid prescribing, we've unfortunately seen an increase in heroin-related morbidity and mortality. HIV, hepatitis, endocarditis, and most recently a dramatic spike in overdose rates due to illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And why is that? Well, because the opioid crisis isn't the diagnosis any more than a yeast infection 
or, or, a, or a foot pain is the diagnosis for someone who has undiagnosed diabetes. It's the symptom of a larger problem that is at play. And if we move a little bit upstream, I call this midstream because this isn't all the way upstream, but if we move midstream, this actually started with a crisis of untreated and undertreated pain, right? And what we see consistently across the board is when we decrease prescribing in this country, we see overdoses go up because we still haven't treated the root problem. We haven't given people an alternative to treat their pain. 62% of people who misuse opioids report that they misuse them to treat pain. So if we take away the opioids, the pain's still there. They're gonna go to something else. And so people are shifting over to heroin, shifting over to fentanyl, and again, we're seeing overdoses come up. So my challenge to each and every one of you is do your part to lower prescribing, but don't just pat yourself on the back for not giving someone an opioid, because in that case, you're really turning your back on their pain. Don't feel good about denying them that opioid unless you can also feel good about the fact that you referred them to another modality to appropriately treat their pain. Otherwise, you may just be sending them into the arms of the heroin dealer. And speaking of sending them into the arms of the heroin dealer, overdoses set yet another annual record in 2017. 70,000 lives taken, more people than die in car wrecks, more people than get shot in our country, more people than any number of other maladies that we can talk about. There's a person dying of an opioid overdose every 11 minutes with over half of those individuals dying at home. I wanna say that to you again, over half of those individuals die at home. So opioid overdose isn't a medical problem, it isn't an EMS problem alone. Remember I talked about silos? Folks are dying in bathrooms, in bedrooms, in garages. And for my medical students out there, how long does it take to get anoxic brain injury? Four to five minutes. Until you all can invent an ambulance that teleports from point A to point B in four to five minutes, we're not going to turn around this opioid overdose epidemic simply relying on our first responders. We need everyone to become a first responder. And I'm gonna do a little uh, experiment here. Raise your hand if you know CPR. All right, raise your hand if you carry naloxone with you. I got one hand. So if someone came in that room right now and said, someone's out in the hallway having a heart attack, we got lots of people who can respond. If someone came in that room right now and said someone's in the bathroom or in the parking lot and we think they're having an opioid overdose, you got one hand that as of right now could run out immediately and be able to respond to that overdose. And I would assert that in a lot of communities across America, you're much more likely to have someone run in and say, there's an overdose happening outside than you are for them to run in and say, there's a heart attack happening outside. So just let that sink in a little bit and you'll understand why I issued that Surgeon General's advisory encouraging folks to be willing to carry naloxone. <laughs> So what are we doing in my office to address the opioid epidemic? Uh, you know, the biggest problem with the opioid epidemic is that it's a big problem. And there's so many different ways that we could address the problem. And people like to point fingers and say, again, it's not me. It's not the doctor's fault. It's not the pharmaceutical company's fault. It's not the patient's fault. You know, the reality is it's everyone's fault. And we've all got a role to play in solving it. Uh, but Here's what I'm working on as Surgeon General. We're working to help healthcare professionals improve prescribing practices with resources like the CDC guidelines uh, for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. We're also trying to help both providers and patients understand the benefits of alternative to opioids. Uh, and I say alternative, in many cases, in most cases, there are modalities that are better than opioids. This is, isn't a, an exchange that that hurts the patient, it isn't even a neutral exchange. It's an exchange that's actually better for the patients, but we need to understand that and we need to help our patients understand that. We also need to help them understand how to properly store and safely dispose of prescription opioids. Why? 
80% of heroin users got started with a prescription opioid. We like to think of drug dealers as these bad people in back alleys. You know who the first drug dealers are in our country? They're your grandmother. They're your aunt. They're statistically speaking, some of you all, because statistically speaking, and I know this, there are several of you all in this room who have unused opioids in your medicine cabinets at home right now. Because we have this mentality in our country that we've got to hoard it. We've got to hoard those extra antibiotics. We've got to hoard those leftover opioids because by golly, it was so hard to get them in the first place. But unfortunately, they end up diverted and end up in the hands of someone else like my brother. They become the pathway to addiction. We don't want you to be the first drug dealer, either because you have unused opioids or because you prescribe opioids unnecessarily that then someone else didn't safely secure or dispose of and they ended up being diverted. My office is also working to educate the public about addiction as a disease and not a moral failing. And I want to say I know you all know this, but I've heard many ignorant comments from doctors, from nurses, from EMTs across the country about the opioid epidemic. Let them die. Why should we keep saving them over and over again? They made the choice. So we can't even assume that as healthcare professionals that everyone is stigma free. We've got to do our job to help everyone understand that addiction is a chronic disease, not a moral failing. We also have to help them understand that just as with any other chronic disease, there are effective evidence-based treatments that are available. And with a survey that came out last year from across the country where they found that 50% of the country does not believe there's an effective treatment for people with substance use disorder. So if half of your country doesn't believe there's an effective treatment, then they're not gonna want their politicians to spend money on treatment, their taxpayer money on treatment, and we're out there saying there's not enough treatment. Well, we're not gonna solve that problem unless we get upstream and help people first recognize that addiction is a disease and that treatment actually works so that they're willing to fund more treatment. Now third, and I mentioned this, my office is working to put naloxone in the hands of not just first responders and community members. And uh, I won't talk any more about that beyond just to uh, uh, advise you towards my naloxone advisory. Uh, do we have that on the, on the PowerPoint? Oh. So please go to my website, um, take a look at that. Please consider carrying naloxone yourselves. Uh, I've got mine in my bag. Dennis, are you here? Do you have my naloxone? It's um, underneath your clothes. Under, oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> so, two different forms of naloxone here. I'm an anesthesiologist, so I've known about naloxone for a long time, but I know about the draw it up from the vial, put it in the syringe, and then give it version. Uh, but there are two different versions for at home use. One is SEO. Uh, or made by FDO, and it is injectable naloxone. And it actually, it actually talks to you. That's literally how easy it is to save a life. It's easier than CPR. And we all know CPR. I know because you all just told me. The other one <laughs> is the intranasal form by a death. And you put it in the nose, just like a flonase, and you just suppress. That's how easy it is to save a life. So I really uh, ask all of you to be willing to carry it, at least become familiar with it so you can talk to other folks about it so we can turn around this opioid overdose epidemic. Also in September of 2018, I released Facing Addiction in America, the Surgeon General's Spotlight on Opioids. It, it gives the latest information on the opioid epidemic, but it also gives a really good and brief synopsis of the Surgeon General's report from my predecessor. The Surgeon General's report from my predecessor is wonderful. It's also 300 pages long, and I've met two people in my life who've actually said that they've read the whole thing from cover to cover. <laughs> so we put out a spotlight that is about 20 pages long that gives the nuts and bolts of opioid addiction and I encourage you to read it. I will tell you that as I was putting it together myself, and I'm an anesthesiologist, trained in acute and chronic 
pain management. I know addiction, I know pain management better than most physicians, and I learned a lot from reading it. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of folks out there, even in the medical community, who, who suffer from stigma and ignorance. There's nothing more powerful than one of you all using your voice out in the community to correct uh, misinformation, to educate people. There's nothing more dangerous than one of you all out in your communities spreading misinformation because then, by golly, it's got the seal of approval, approval of Dr. So-and-so. Dr. So-and-so says naloxone doesn't work. Dr. So-and-so says MAT isn't an effective treatment for people. Dr. So-and-so says addiction is a choice. <coughs> so I ask you to take an hour and read that spotlight. Uh, I read through it in about 45 minutes, so uh, it, it actually is, is very digestible. It's designed to be a, like a long journal article, but uh, kind of a crib notes on uh, the best science available on addiction. I also put out, well, anyone remember this guy called C. Everett Coop? <laughs> my, my predecessor, um, almost 40 years ago, sent a pamphlet to everyone in the country called Understanding AIDS, because we were dealing with an epidemic during that time, the likes of which no one had ever seen before. And the public was scared, and everyone was pointing fingers, and no one knew what to do. Sound familiar? So he sent out a pamphlet to everyone in America helping them understand how they could respond to the HIV epidemic. Well, I thought the opioid epidemic called for a similar approach, but we don't send out snail mail anymore. Um, what I put out was a digital postcard. Are you about to cut me off? Oh my gosh, I've only got seven minutes left. Sorry, you guys should have told me I've been talking for too long. Uh, this is the Surgeon General's digital postcard that lists five steps that everyone can take to respond to the opioid epidemic. And uh, it's on my website, surgeongeneral.gov. You can download the PDF, send it out through your Facebook, your Twitter, your, uh, your, your social media channels. Help me distribute this across the country so that everyone knows the steps that they can take to respond to the opioid epidemic. I want to hit a couple of quick other points, e-cigarettes. <laughs> 78% increase in young people using e-cigarettes <laughs> last year. Uh, one out of 20 middle schoolers, one out of five high schoolers are using e-cigarettes. This is a big problem, folks. A big problem. It is the largest increase in youth use of any substance that we've seen in the 40-year history of surveying use on these substances. We've seen youth tobacco use go down for the, over, for the last two decades. We're now seeing youth use of tobacco products going back up again. We're losing the gains we've made, and it's all because of e-cigarettes. So please talk to uh, your, your, your patients, um, children, uh, at, at any encounter, talk to them about e-cigarettes, because I don't want us to see a new generation of folks addicted to nicotine, which we know has unique effects on learning attention and memory in young people, which we know can prime your brain for addiction, a jewel pod. A jewel pod contains as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. There was a study where they looked at adolescents who used uh, jewel vaping devices and found cotinine, which is a breakdown product of nicotine. Cotinine levels higher than in adolescents who would smoke cigarettes. So these devices are delivering more nicotine to young people than even traditional cigarettes. Now don't confuse that with harm reduction. I'm not saying that these devices are more dangerous than cigarettes if you're a current smoker. That's a separate argument and people will try to suck you into that argument. I'm saying I don't want my 12 year old using either product. And right now, 12 year olds are using these products. And so we need you all to help us, un help America understand uh, the dangers of e-cigarettes for our young people. Uh, I'm gonna lean into marijuana and youth use later this year. Um, the marijuana issue is complicated. We need to have a more nuanced discussion than tweets and sound bites on marijuana. In my opinion, the marijuana issue has three different components. There's the discussion about the medicinal properties of marijuana, and I'm gonna frustrate some of you all in here, but I will tell you that scientifically and federally, there is no such thing as medical marijuana. There's no such thing as medical marijuana any more than there's a such thing as medical poppy. Do you prescribe poppy to your patients? No. We have a scientifically validated process 
to evaluate medications and to determine which components of different substances have a benefit, which components have a risk, which diseases they're appropriate for, and when they should be prescribed. And we need to follow that process for the medicinal properties of marijuana. Marijuana, which has several hundred different components in it. Again, some harmful, some beneficial. But we need to make sure we're going through that process. That's the medicinal side. On the, uh, there's also the criminal side. And I've got to tell you, as someone who has a brother in jail, I don't think it's fair, appropriate, that in one state it's legal, and in another state it can be your third strike and you can go to jail for 20 years. <coughs> so that's something for the Attorney General, and I told you I wasn't the Attorney General. <laughs> but you need to understand the different parts of this argument. The third part about recreational use. It would be completely disingenuous of me as Surgeon General to say you shouldn't smoke cigarettes, the thing that people most know me for, but to say I'm perfectly fine with you lighting up a joint. I am not in favor of recreational use of marijuana. I also think it's important for you all as physicians to help people understand this isn't your mother's marijuana. In the 1980s and 90s, marijuana was less than 5% THC. Marijuana extracts now are now over 50% in some cases THC. The part of it that makes you high, not the good part, <coughs> not the cannabidiol, the THC. So any medication you take, Pick any medication and increase the dose tenfold, and then you tell me that it's okay to tell folks that we haven't tested this, but it's fine. Go ahead and use it. We should let everyone have access to it. So that's, that's on the marijuana side. I said I was going to talk about community health and economic prosperity, but really the point to that is that we need to help businesses, we need to help communities, we need to help mayors, we need to help voters understand that investing in health is essential to their priorities, their economic prosperity. I'll tell you a really quick story. Um, I was talking to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. I had Mayor Bill de Blasio from New York on one side. I had uh, Mayor Benjamin from Columbia, South Carolina on another side. About 50 mayors around the room and I wanted to know what made them tick. So I said, how many of you all ran for office on a pledge to lower your hemoglobin A1C rates by 15%? <laughs> Not a single person raised their hand. I was shocked. <laughs> but the reality is that's how we talk. We go out and talk about this great diabetes prevention program that's going to lower hemoglobin A1C rates by 15%. Mayor, if you'd only give me uh, $50,000 or $100,000, we could do great things in this community for hemoglobin A1C rates. But that's not what drives the mayor or voters or anyone else. Now, if we said, look, the data says the number one expense for employers in your town is health care. And the number one driver of health care costs is diabetes. And we've got a great program it's going to help lower your diabetes rates, lower those companies' health care costs, make you a more attractive community for businesses for Amazon to come and move to, and wages will increase because instead of having to pay for increasing health care costs, these companies can then contribute them their wages. All of a sudden, that's a proposition that makes sense to a mayor or to an employer. So we need to really uh, change the way that we interact with folks and, um, and uh, engage them. The final point I would make to all of you all, it goes back to my point about my two different jobs. The one being providing hands-on health care downstream and the other being advocating upstream. When they look at public health, when they look at overall health, not, not public health, when they look at overall health, less than 10% of health is actually access to health care. And I know that's going to be offensive to some of you all <coughs> because, gosh, we spend our whole lives figuring out how to provide the best health care we can. But 80 to 90 percent of health is environment, it's behaviors, it's choices. And so if you all want to keep from being burned out during your careers, we need to focus more of our attention on the 80 to 90 percent. And I don't want to say less of our attention on the 10 percent, but we need to figure out how we can work smarter and not just keep working harder on the 10 percent and expecting that we're going to change an equation that is 90 percent affected by something else. So I encourage you all to use your voices, try to figure out how you can get upstream, talk to your patients about some of these key issues that are affecting them, and thank you so much for the opportunity to serve as your 20th United States Surgeon General. Thank you for being patient with me as I rambled on a little bit. Um, I love you guys, and I hope that uh, when I'm done one day, you all will invite me
back out here and maybe I can spend some more time with you. So thank you so much. I maybe have time for one or two questions before they pull me out. Yes. Um, patients have stigma towards alternative treating modalities. Physicians do. Um, and I think the, uh, I just wanna, the one thing though I do disagree with you about, with all due respect, is the National Academy of Sciences 2017 Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids, where they did a massive literature review and they broke it down very nicely to conclusive evidence of benefit for chronic neuropathic pain chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, multiple sclerosis, subjective spasticity symptoms, and uh, the need to release some of the restrictions about it so that it can be studied uh, scientifically, which is one of your pillars. So I, I wanna, uh, we, have to, we have to hurry up, but I wanna say first, kudos to you for challenging the Surgeon General. <laughs> Number two, I wanna say, I actually agree with everything that you just said. And I don't want folks to misunderstand me. When I said there is no such thing as medicinal marijuana, again, I was saying just like there's no such thing as medicinal poppy. There are medicinal components to the poppy plant. There are medicinal components to the marijuana plant. And no other drug out there that I can think of, had we said, take the raw form and, in a completely unregulated manner and self-titrate to, uh, to a point where you feel it's appropriate. And no other plant had we also used research that's based on 20-year-old data where it, was a, where it was 10 times less than the dose. And so I agree with you. There are medicinal properties of marijuana. And I have said publicly that we need to continue to try to figure out the barriers that exist to doing research so that we can do more research and so that we can make the medicinal properties of marijuana much more known and much more available to folks, but without doing something that no one else in medicine would say is sane, and hey, just take this plant. Just take this plant, figure it out, you'll be fine, and if your kids start taking more of it too, because here's another statistic that's interesting. In the states that have legalized medicinal marijuana, we've actually seen youth use of marijuana go up. The stats actually show that the number one, one of the number one ways youth get marijuana is through an adult's medicinal marijuana card. It's being diverted. All this is happening, and so we need to figure out the right balance, and right now, the right balance to me isn't unfettered endorsement and access of people self-titrating and self-medicating with unregulated plants and other substances. One more quick question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to shout out, uh, Admiral, thank you for coming. Uh, the good news about the Public Health Service up in Alaska, which I think is phenomenal, people don't realize that uh, most of the surgeons up there now trained in this program here at the Integrated Surgical Residency, three of our residents at any one time are up in Alaska. And having been there myself over several decades, it's phenomenal what the Public Health Service has done to this very hostile environment up in the Arctic. Uh, we were there um, just, a, uh, just a few months ago, and I'm going out to a couple of tribal facilities today. And uh, I will tell you, if you have an opportunity to go out to some of those facilities and to meet the folks and deliver care, it will change your life in many ways. You'll meet some of the kindest um, people out there that, that you've ever met. You'll meet some of the most forgotten about people that you've ever met. You'll see uh, medical issues that you thought couldn't exist in the United States. And it's why it's so important that we have good people who are willing to go out there. They're gonna make me go, but can I get a selfie with you all before we leave? <laughs> uh, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Thank you so much, everyone, I really appreciate it. So thank you everybody for joining us. We are so honored to have Dr. Adams, and thank you Dr. Reed for opening up the College of Medicine. I know you have a book. Um, and thank you for signing.
And we so appreciate that everyone was able to come out. So thank you. All right, he's gonna go visit. He's got a very busy day, so we're gonna try and scoot him out pretty quick. So thank you, everyone.